Hello, bonjour. My name is Paulo de Castro Reis, and I'm the executive director of CCBC. Welcome to the first Brazilian Week CCBC Online Festival, a digital event organized by the Chamber of Commerce Brazil Canada in partnership with the Brazilian Embassy in Ottawa, the Brazilian consulates in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, and sponsored by Air Canada. The festival presents more than 20 webinars covering three content areas, business opportunities, innovation, and Brazilian culture. Besides the Brazilian Week website offers free access to more than 200 cultural contents. In this session, we'll have simultaneous translation. Uh, so, uh, Please see on the screen the instructions on how to activate the simultaneous translation by pressing this button uh, indicated with the yellow arrow. I have the plan. Okay, thank you. All right, so I have the special pleasure to present the Brazilian Minister of Regional Development, Robert, Rogério Marinho. Minister Rogério Marinho is an economist and professor and is a recognized politician from Rio Grande do Norte in the Northeast region of Brazil. The ambassador Pedro Borio is also following this session with us and we are all very honored with the presence of the Minister Rogério Marinho today. Thank you very much, Minister Rogério Marinho, and welcome to our session. Bem-vindo, Ministro. Obrigado, Pedro. Obrigado a todos aí que estão nesse webinar. É, em especial o embaixador, a Consul e o nosso mediador. Né? Espero que, de alguma maneira, eu acho que o Cleiton eu terei ele do ar aqui por algum motivo. Bom, espero que todos estejam me ouvindo. Né? A nossa a nossa expectativa é que é, temos uma boa conversa hoje e possamos continuar a estabelecer e fortalecer esses laços de amizade entre o Canadá e o Brasil. Né, que já são centenários, né? nós temos aí uma longa história de bons negócios, de boa articulação né, e de bons relacionamentos. Nós estamos vivendo aqui, a exemplo do mundo inteiro, é, o Brasil, o Canadá também, é, problemas relacionados com essa pandemia que nos acometeu a todos. Então eu gostaria de começar falando um pouco a respeito do que é a atividade do nosso ministério. É um ministério novo, né, porque ele foi criado com a nova administração do presidente Bolsonaro e uniu é, duas atividades distintas, é, o ministério, o antigo Ministério da Integração Regional e o Ministério das Cidades. Então, a nossa atividade é uma atividade que, ao mesmo tempo que leva em consideração a mobilidade urbana, a infraestrutura urbana, né, a questão é, do saneamento básico, com todas as suas vertentes e marcos legais, é, a questão da habitação como um todo, também se preocupa com a defesa civil, é, com o enfrentamento às desigualdades regionais e com a segurança hídrica é, do nosso país. Eu diria que talvez assim a ação mais impactante, mais transversal do nosso ministério é a segurança hídrica. Nós somos um dos países que tem é, o maior manancial, um dos maiores mananciais de água doce, né, com os nossos rios, com os nossos reservatórios, com os nossos lençóis freáticos. E, basicamente, o principal produto eh, das nossas exportações está no agronegócio, que basicamente é água. Então, nós exportamos água. Então, por isso, a necessidade de gerirmos de forma adequada os nossos eh, recursos. O nosso ministério ele começa eh, em março de 2020, o que eu denomino um marco zero. Nós somos um ministério que tem atividades em 5.200 dos 5.570 municípios espalhados por todo o país, nesse país de dimensões continentais, como também o é, é o Canadá. Né? Nós temos essa, essa 
é, é, afinidade, né? nós temos é, situações parecidas em relação ao tamanho dos nossos respectivos países. Nós somos dos cinco maiores países do mundo, a exemplo do Canadá, que também é um dos cinco maiores países do mundo. Né? Isso tem lados positivos e tem o um lado negativo. Nós somos um país de muitas desigualdades. Né? Então, nesse processo de, de carteira é, de projetos, basicamente a totalidade da nossa carteira, isso é histórico, ela se baseia no orçamento geral da União ou nos empréstimos que são concedidos pelo nosso Fundo de Garantia sobre Tempo de Serviço, né, que é gerido também pelo nosso Ministério em conjunto com o Ministério da Economia. Então, nós começamos a fazer uma guinada, uma mudança, para que as ações empreendidas pelo nosso Ministério se voltem para a iniciativa privada. É, repetindo, inclusive, movimentos que já foram feitos anteriormente por outras áreas do governo. É, nós exemplificamos o que ocorreu, por exemplo, na área é, de energia no nosso país. Há mais de 20 anos começa um movimento que hoje está maduro e consolidado, que é permitir que a expansão do sistema elétrico no Brasil, né, essa, essa, essa edificação de linhas de transmissão, de usinas e de, e de PCHs, e de energia eólica, energia por fonte, né, a equalização das tarifas se desse, é, dividindo o custo desse processo pelo conjunto de consumidores que, por sua vez, ganham uma maior eficiência é, na, na questão energética e uma diminuição da tarifa pela sua competitividade e produtividade. Então, esse é um processo é, de mais de 20 anos. É exemplo também do que ocorreu na infraestrutura. É, a infraestrutura no nosso país já majoritariamente trata com a iniciativa privada na área de concessões, é, de terminais graneleiros, de terminais portuários, é, de estradas, de aeroportos, de portos, de ferrovias, mas esse é um processo também é de 20 a 15 anos, inclusive essa é uma área que tem é, uma, uma, uma expertise na criação de uma, uma estrutura governamental apenas para a produção é, de projetos estruturados, né, que permitem que a iniciativa privada possa, é, em conjunto conosco, enfrentar os desafios da melhoria da nossa infraestrutura. O que nós estamos fazendo é justamente identificando essas, essas oportunidades de negócios em função da modernização dos nossos marcos regulatórios, né? e eu quero exemplificar aqui de uma forma muito especial a mudança dos parâmetros da nossa, do nosso saneamento básico, que depois de seis anos de tramitação no Congresso Nacional pela liderança do presidente Bolsonaro, foi finalmente aprovado há pouco mais de 30 dias atrás, e essa mudança permite que a iniciativa privada possa conosco enfrentar né, esse desafio da universalização do tratamento de água, é, de esgotos e a destinação adequada dos resíduos sólidos no nosso país. Para isso, nós vamos precisar atrair a iniciativa privada. E uma das ações que nós estamos empreendendo no nosso Ministério é justamente a mudança é, da estrutura dos nossos fundos de desenvolvimento, para que eles possam estruturar projetos e performá-los para constar na nossa carteira é, oportunidades que possam ser é, capturadas pela iniciativa privada. Projetos que nós queremos que tenham um padrão de OCDE, né, de Banco Mundial, é, com todas as práticas de governança, de sustentabilidade, é, de desenvolvimento sustentável, né, que são as boas práticas é, que existem no mundo inteiro. Então, é a nossa preocupação essa pegada verde, essa necessidade de termos uma preocupação é, que, ao mesmo tempo em que inserimos as pessoas oferecendo é, alternativa de geração de renda e emprego, ao mesmo tempo é, esse desenvolvimento tem a sustentabilidade em cima de governança e de respeito ao meio ambiente. É, essa é uma preocupação é, de virada de, de, de forma como a nossa carteira vai se comportar daqui por diante. Então, a reestruturação dos fundos é uma sinalização nesse sentido, porque nós estamos aqui fortemente é, comprometidos com as reformas estruturantes que já começaram desde a última administração, ainda no governo Temer, né, que iniciou-se com a responsabilidade fiscal, com as mudanças na legislação trabalhista, a modernização da legislação trabalhista, e no ano passado, de uma forma muito impactante, a reestruturação do nosso sistema previdenciário e uma série de mudanças regulatórias importantes. 
Nós estamos no Congresso Nacional estabelecendo uma base sólida e o governo, por sua vez, tem cada vez mais é, mantido um processo de interlocução com o Parlamento Brasileiro para continuar nessa agenda de reformas. Mudanças dos marcos ligados à cabotagem, à navegação de cabotagem é na nossa costa. A questão da lei do gás, que vai permitir a importação do gás é, liquefeito e regasificação nos nossos terminais para que eles possam é, permitir um menor custo e a maior produtividade da nossa indústria como um todo. É, mudanças regulatórias é, na questão, nas questões tarifárias. Nós estamos envolvidos numa reforma tributária é, extremamente impactante para para o nosso país, a reforma administrativa para diminuir o tamanho do Estado e tornar o Estado mais eficaz, onde ele realmente precisa intervir, principalmente no auxílio aos vulneráveis, no enfrentamento às desigualdades regionais e no fomento a uma economia de mercado que permita a participação da iniciativa privada, oferecendo previsibilidade, segurança jurídica e respeito a contratos. Essa segurança, sem dúvida nenhuma, ela é é, eu diria um diferencial que vai permitir que a liquidez que existe no mundo inteiro, e eu não tenho dúvida que também é, nos principais players econômicos do Canadá, possam ser investidos nas alternativas, nas oportunidades que estão sendo geradas aqui no Brasil. O nosso Ministério, de forma muito especial, além da área do saneamento, que trata é, de esgotamento sanitário, de água é, é, de boa qualidade na, na, para a população, né, do destino adequado do resíduo sólido, da macro-drenagem, nós estamos tratando também de iluminação pública, no sentido de modernização é, com lâmpadas de LED, para diminuir a necessidade de manutenção, de mobilidade urbana, com intervenções as mais variadas, desde a questão de metrôs, de VLTs, até infraestrutura para permitir uma melhor fluidez do trânsito, área de habitação né, e também uma área que para nós é, é extremamente importante, que é a área hídrica. Nós estamos concluindo a transposição dos um nossos principais rios, que é o São Francisco, e existe uma série de obras acessórias que vão permitir que, a partir dessa infraestrutura construída, a água possa ser é, democratizada e levada a um conjunto maior de cidadãos. Então, adutoras, reservatórios, perímetros irrigados, soluções de energias alternativas para permitir o bombeamento dessa água, eu falo de eólica e solar, né, a revitalização dessas bacias, que são bacias importantes que se encontram na região central do Brasil, e aí eu falo tanto do São Francisco como do, do Taquari, lá no Pantanal Mato Grossense, é do Parnaíba, que divide o Piauí e o Maranhão, dois estados importantes do Nordeste brasileiro, né, e o Tocantins e Araguaia, que nasce no nosso centro-oeste, que é a região de maior, é, de maior incidência de uma agricultura de forte impacto na área de mecanização e de inovação tecnológica e que deságua no estado do Pará, já no Oceano Atlântico, é praticamente na metade do Brasil. São rios que nós estamos tendo uma preocupação de tratar a sua revitalização, tratando o esgoto, tratando o resíduo sólido dos perímetros, fazendo plantação ou manutenção de plantações de árvores nas suas regiões ciliares, fazendo o é, resguardando as suas nascentes, desassoreando esses rios, enfim, fazendo todo um tratamento para permitir que eles continuem vivos né, e possam nos ajudar nesse esforço de desenvolvimento sustentável. E, ao mesmo tempo, permitir que o perímetro desses rios possa se ocupar de forma ordenada, ou seja, que, ao mesmo tempo que geremos emprego, renda e oportunidades, temos uma preocupação é, com o meio ambiente e com a preservação das nascentes e dos perímetros ao longo do de toda a sua extensão. Então, em suma, de uma forma bastante sucinta, é o que nós estamos fazendo aqui é no nosso Ministério, por orientação do nosso presidente, né? ou seja, levar o desenvolvimento através da infraestrutura para re regiões que estão deprimidas do ponto de vista econômico, já que nós somos o Ministério do Desenvolvimento Social, mas sempre com essa pegada é, de respeito a contratos, de previsibilidade para quem investe no país, segurança jurídica e se colocar de pé projetos estruturados que permitam que haja um conforto para quem investe no Brasil, identificando os paybacks de retorno do seu investimento com a segurança que todos nós queremos e desejamos nessa parceria que certamente já é muito importante e será cada vez mais sólida no futuro.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Rogério Marinho, for your presentation. As you mentioned, Brazil offers greater opportunities for investment. And now we're going to move for the second part of our session, where we will talk a little bit about opportunities related to environmental social governance and sustainability. And I would like to call Ricardo Zibas, Head of Sustainability Services at K KPMG Brazil, to moderate this session. Welcome, Ricardo. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm trying to start my video here. I think somebody put my my video because Ricardo yeah, Zibas. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, okay. Hello. Now, okay, okay, now it goes. Welcome All right. again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, just before, you, I, I, I just want to say hello. I, I can see the Consul General Heather Cameron joining. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Heather. Okay, uh, now I leave the, the, the session to Ricardo. I, I just wanted to say a quick informal hello to the Consul General, but uh, please move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paulo. Uh, like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. So good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ricardo Zibas. I'm the head of sustainability services at KPMG Brazil. And I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Heather Cameron, who is responsible for the General Consulate of Canada in Brazil for a quick presentation. Uh, Mrs. Cameron, good evening. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Ms. Cameron, I think, I think you are on mute. Uh, desculpa. <laughs> Good afternoon, boa tarde, uh, bonsoir. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Em primeiro, queria agradecer o ministro por sua presença e também a presença da ambassador Boria, ambassador brasileiro ao Canadá. Um, obrigada, senhor ministro, por seus comentários, por uh, as palavras uh, sobre as importâncias das relações entre o Canadá e o Brasil. E durante os primeiros meses que estou aqui em Brasil, a uh, verdade e os laços são estreitos e importantes e tem muitas oportunidades de desenvolver ainda mais. Uh, queria uh, também uh, parabenizar o Brasil para sua dia nacional nesta semana, dia 7 de setembro. Mais uma vez, parabéns. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to join you on this panel uh, today. Um, and uh, let me also just thank CCBC uh, for the opportunity and for bringing us together. Canada and Brazil, our relationship in terms of trade goes back over 150 years. Uh, diplomatically, we soon will celebrate 80 years of uh, relations. And um, an increasing uh, depth and breadth to the people-to-people -people ties uh, between our two countries. And I think it's important to recognize how important the trade and investment relationships are in both directions and to both countries. And so it is uh, this area of sustainability, an area where we can continue to collaborate, to discuss and to learn uh, from each other as we uh, move forward uh, to a more sustainable uh, future. Canada and Brazil as members of the United Nations, uh, important partners within the hemisphere. We are uh, committed to the sustainable development goals and, and Canada has uh, our pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, which has been developed with our provinces, our territories, and in consultation with the indigenous peoples of Canada. 
in order that we can both reduce our admissions, grow our economy, and build resilience within the country. And um, the new focus building on earlier initiatives, earlier understandings around environment, social, and corporate governance criteria is one that's guiding both policy work and uh, investments. And we believe strongly that the private sector has an important role to play in helping to develop a more sustainable uh, future. As the Government of Canada, we also include issues of diversity, of gender equality, of social inclusion as important areas of, uh, within sustainability. And the diplomatic offices of Canada here in Brazil, we are working uh, together with Brazilian partners, uh, the Government of Brazil and others in dialogue and engagement on these issues and to bring forward important initiatives such as the new uh, framework for women in mining here in Brazil, which was featured earlier uh, this week uh, during the festival. And also to engage with private sector partners on issues of inclusion, for example, around um, uh, refugees and employment. So uh, many different areas that we work on today, but today uh, together. But today, let's uh, focus a little bit in terms of the trade in and I will focus a little bit in terms of trade and investment. And I'm very proud that 12 of the top 100 clean tech companies in the world are Canadian and that many of them are active here uh, in Brazil. And as the minister said, we are both vast countries with important resources, endowments, and important responsibilities that come from, uh, from those endowments. And fresh water, coastal protection, inequalities are areas uh, where we have, uh, I think, opportunities uh, to continue to explore and to learn from each other. Um, and the COVID pandemic that both countries are facing along with many others around the world um, I think it's just accelerating the desire for transformation, uh, whether it's digital or whether it's to move towards uh, the triple bottom line of uh, a greater unified focus around social, environmental and financial in, um, uh, benefits. So if I think a little bit about our two countries and where there are synergies and where we're active in the area of sustainability, let me just focus on three areas right now, water, mining and energy. And the minister has spoken well about the importance to his government of the air issues of water and sanitation, important for Brazilians and for all of the progress. And it's significant that the Brazil has made. There are still 35 million Brazilians without access to potable water, over 100 million without access to sewage. And so there's a great deal of opportunities um, for private sector involvement in the new framework uh, the government of Brazil has developed uh, is to encourage that and Canada's strengths in this area already active in Brazil and with room um, to grow. And today on our panel, we have BRK Ambiental, the largest private uh, water and sanitation company in Brazil, which is owned by Brookfield of Canada, uh, with us to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing. And in fact, BRK Ambiental has the largest uh, PPP, public private partnership in Brazil in the area of sanitation in the Northeast and uh, some very exciting results, some very important services which are being delivered. The newest private sanitation company in Brazil, Iguasanamento, also has Canadian investment in it. And it was encouraging to see uh, recently that Iguasanamento issued the first bonds, uh, sustainable bonds in the sanitation sector. So lots of innovation taking place and uh, we're proud to be part of that. Other Canadian companies from across Canada are engaged in areas of wastewater management, uh, water treatment, and as uh, the minister spoke, uh, these are important uh, resources that need to be managed well, and we're pleased that uh, some of our technologies are helping uh, to do that, um, including detecting leaks uh, on water pipelines and so forth. 
Um, mining, uh, important sectors for both countries and uh, with Vale here on the panel as well, an important investor in Canada and Canadian mining companies important here. And um, it was uh, very encouraging to see last year that the National Mining Association of Brazil, IBRAM, adopted the Mining Association of Canada's Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative and this uh, program to improve the environmental and social practices within the mining industry. This new partnership in this uh, key sector for both countries is one that's exciting and important uh, in terms of sustainable development going uh, forward. I referenced earlier the new uh, work that's just been launched in terms of Women in Mining Canada, working with Women in Mining in Brazil in IBRAM, to develop the new framework to encourage more gender equality uh, within uh, this important uh, sector. And for those um, listening, of course, there's many other Canadian companies that are working here with Brazil, in Brazil with Brazilian partners to reduce emissions in the mining sector to help improve uh, technologies, efficiencies, and uh, that's very exciting. Uh, if I turn to energy, again, the minister spoke about the importance of this and in the hydropower, many opportunities for collaboration, but I think important to recognize the role of Canadian solar and in the renewable ex uh, energy uh, sector. And Canadian uh, solar uh, has significant investments here across a number of uh, states within Brazil. Uh, in Paraná, in the northeast, Pernambuco, Minas Gerais, Sao Paulo, important production facilities. And uh, we're really pleased to see uh, the engagement of this um, important Canadian company and many others in the area of renewables. And some collaborations too also taking place in other parts of the energy sector, such as hydro and oil and gas. Let me just uh, finally mention, and I see the slide is up, um, for those Canadian companies or companies looking to do business with Canada that uh, looking for a Canadian uh, uh, technology, our Trade Commissioner Service uh, based in Sao Paulo as well as five other cities across the country, including Recife, offers a number of services to Canadian companies. Uh, they're up on the slide there and our key um, clean tech and energy renewable energy officers um, are their contacts are listed there for should you wish to follow up and to continue to explore the opportunities that are in Brazil as the minister has highlighted for us already thank you muito obrigada mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cameron, for this overview. Um, well, I, I have a, a very quick presentation myself. When I, when I was asked to talk a little bit the ESG opportunities in Brazil, uh, I thought it would be interesting um, not only to focus not only on the E or the S or the G, but also in an issue which uh, is coming, is, is getting more and more important uh, in Brazilian companies, which is transparency and accountability. So, and like I said, it's a very quick presentation, just two slides, but KPMG is just uh, releasing uh, a global research, uh, just um, comparing the, the, the degrees of transparency of uh, ESG reporting across the world. So uh, I have the privilege to, to show a little bit of this research um, for you, to you, in first hand. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm not allowed to show the, the whole research, but I think it's, it's a food for thought and I think it will be a, a good insight for our debate later on. So if you can please share um, my presentation, I, I may start. Thank you.
Okay. I don't know if you guys are seeing this. All right, now it goes. Thank you, Mikaeli. Well, it's, it's very quick uh, indeed. Um, just two slides, like I said. Uh, the first one uh, will be a, a global overview of the reporting rate of ESG information um, on a group of selected countries. As you can see, uh, Brazil, it's, it's ranked among the top 15 countries in the world, which means that around 85% of listed companies in Brazil do report ESG information, which is a very similar rate uh, as Canada, which stands pretty much on, on, on the same level. To the left, you can see uh, the countries that have more, uh, uh, that do report more ESG information companies that um, are, are ahead on, on the rate of reporting but uh, usually uh, this uh, when you reach like a hundred percent or a ninety percent is because you you have some kind of compliance attached to the reporting so i would like to point that uh, in brazil you don't have to report esg information it's on a voluntary basis so it's a quite high um, number on, on, on a voluntary report and quite a high, high index. And it's, it's expected that this index will rise on, on the coming years because what we see right now, it, it's a huge wave of ESG reporting and transparency and accountability, mainly on the energy sectors, the exporting sectors, and also on the mining sector. So, this rate of 85% is expected to increase because if you take the, this, this research, and we have been doing this for over 10 years now, uh, the rates are, are on a steady pace of, of increase. So I would like to just, you know, just give, give this information. So we might use it, this on the debate right uh, afterwards. But I think it's very important to note that Brazilian companies are very committed and, and, and are very, you know, embarking on the ESG reporting uh, standards. And for our clients, uh, more and more, we see that it's very important them to have KPIs and indicators and more, moreover, to measure their social and environmental impacts in the society, which is, is quite a hot topic among companies here in Brazil right now. So that's it. And I'd like to call my colleague, Mr. Carlos Almiro, who is the head of sustainability at BRK Ambiental. Carlos, my friend, you have the floor. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank CCBC for the opportunity to point out some aspects of sanitation and how innovation innovation help to ensure ESG agenda. Let me introduce our company. Uh, we are uh, a Brookfield sanitation platform in Brazil, operating in 12 states and benefiting 15 million people in Brazil. Before discussing the potential of the sanitation sector in Brazil, it's important to say that we are facing a sad reality in terms of inequality caused by the lack of sanitation. In Brazil, 100 million Brazilians have no access to sewer. More than that, almost the entire population of Canada has no access to portable water. This sad reality imposed to the population, especially the poorest one, several social and environmental impacts. Sanitation is an urgent call to action, and the lack of the service causes several social impacts. The absence of sanitation service affects everyone, but women are especially affected. Over 1.5 million women do not have bathrooms in their homes. In terms of health impacts, the rates of diarrhea in girls under the age of 13 is 76% higher than the Brazilian average. 
education is also an impact pathway. School performance gap has a 10% reduction by access to treated water and sword. The post pandemic will raise a lot of challenges in terms of income and employment. The universalization would increase the income of around 300 reais for each woman without access per year. It's important to point out that in developing countries, women oversee home daily routines and when she or one of her family members gets sick because sanitation related disease, she loses productivity, affecting her income. But we have good news. Brazil has approved the new regulatory framework that will bring to us the opportunity to solve this sad reality. The approved system, Mr. Marinho, is the biggest inequality reduction program of our history. By providing, by providing sanitation to everyone, we will improve income, reduce gender and the school gap, and boost employment and mitigate pressure to the public health system. On the other hand, to cope with this challenge, Brazil will need around 700 billion reais and these investments will close the gap of inequality produced by the absence of sanitation and at the same time will allow us, allow us to start the green economy recovery. It's important to highlight that these investments and the universalization need need to be addressed considering the ESD agenda, especially climate change. So that innovation, it's a key aspect to be incorporated on investment agenda. ESA is focused on innovative solution to deal with the expansion of the sanitation service. Let me give you two examples. Treatment of wastewater is a relevant carbon emission source. We are implementing innovative plants that reduce around 90% of carbon emissions compared to an ordinary facility. Another example is the sludge treatment. The sludge is the final result of wastewater treatment and it's composed by 80% of water. Nowadays, the sludge is disposed on landfills which is not a sustainable solution. We are developing technologies to dry it up this sludge and improve its use for recycling opportunity, such as steel mill. Solar energy, it's also an opportunity to improve efficiency. As you probably know, a wastewater facility takes in a lot of energy. So in the Northeast, we are installing solar energy farms that covers for 60% of electricity expand. Reduce water loss, it's also a big challenge for Brazil. Our country wastes 40% of all treated water. At BRK, we are innovating in new technologies to avoid water loss. Until now, we have reduced 9.5 billion liters of water, which is equivalent to a consumption of a city with 200,000 inhabitants. Finally, I would, I would say that sanitation is a big opportunity to improve ESG agenda. ESG is really connected to sanitation needs and will let us recover the economy severely impacted by the pandemic. Thank you for your time and I'm available for further questions. Thank you very much, my friend Carlos, uh, for this um, interesting insights on, on the industry. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to call another colleague, uh, who is uh, Marcia Suarez. She's an environmental specialist at Valley. Uh, so please, Marcia, you have the floor. Thank you.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to my webinar colleagues, Mr. Minister Rogério, Mr. Reda, Cameron, Paulo Ricardo, and Carlos. And let me share uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, let me see. Well, just a little. Um, Hmm, I don't know. I think I, if someone could help me with my presentation, Mikael, yes, I, I want. Uh, I can't hear. If someone could uh, share my presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for what? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the CCBC for this invitation. And I'm Marcia Soares, and I'm head of partnerships of, of Val Fund. Uh, and it's a pleasure to me to be here today to talk about Valley's sustainability actions. Uh, uh, could you pass the slide? The next. Uh, Vale, uh, you know, is a global mining company, uh, one of the biggest, and has an, a nickel operation in Canada. And I want to show how it's possible to innovate and incorporate social investments. Uh, last year, uh, the company uh, updated our six very bold sustainability goals uh, in the social, environmental, and governance areas. And these goals, uh, are in line with the sustainable development objectives uh, with uh, 2030 vision and in the terms of forest conservation, greenhouse gas emission, social and governance improvements. And Valley Fund is working directly with the company in, uh, in Valley's forest commitment through the promotion of a more sustainable chain in impact business in forest restoration. And uh, could, could pass the, the next, please. Uh, Valley Fund uh, is part of Valley's strategy for corporate social responsibility. We have 10 years of operation and we was created as a voluntary contribution net to sustainable development in critical biomes like Amazon, for example. And Valley Fund supports 75 initiatives initiatives, né? uh, 75 projects uh, with uh, $4 million invested. And our strategy is focus on impact investments and impact business né? through shared value. And we work with a, a social environmental innovation lab inside Valley. And this way we can enhance uh, Valley sustainability initiatives and goals. And Valley has many other instruments of uh, its uh, social corporate uh, responsibility, like Valley Foundation, like uh, Valley Technolo Technology Institute, and, and others. Né? And then uh, Fundo Valley is one of these. Uh, the next, please. And, and Valley Fund believe that one of the ways to solve the social and the environmental problems is through business, impact investments, impact business, we know, I, I'm talking. And, and we has worked with a venture philanthropy approach using a mechanism like a blended finance models where it's possible to combine grants and philanthropic resources né, with, with uh, market investments. Yeah, we are testing uh, uh, innovative models uh, to prove that it's possible to make profit. And at the same time, uh, we have positive and social um, impacts. Yeah. We, we are talking about strengthening a business, a small business sometimes, yeah, uh, that values as uh, sustainable entrepreneurs. Yeah. And we support many initiatives in environmental area, uh, in, in climate change, in forest, and other uh, issues. And, and I want to know uh, some projects uh, to, to, 
uh, to example, né? Uh, like uh, one of these is this project, uh, Partnerships for Amazon Platform. That's a project created by USAID to engage the private sector for a new model of development né, in Amazon. And in this project, we accelerate local startups that bring environmental and social positive impacts and that value the standing forest. Né? We, we have uh, accelerated uh, about uh, 30 startups at this moment. Uh, the next, please. Uh, another, another initiative is a project called Climate Ventures that support the good business for the climate, which offers mentoring, support, and, and a, a, a bold program for business impact that are in initial phase. Yeah? And uh, this project, uh, uh, it's a platform for collective action that, that identify strengthening good business for the climate yeah? in Brazil. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, other initiative, it's Connexus Impact Fund. Né? The first credit line of this fund aims to mitigate the economic impacts of the coronavirus virus pandemic, uh, especially to community business uh, that work with sustainable production and, and extractivism in Brazil. And we offer credits for small business in special conditions with more flexibility, reimbursement, with a combo to support financial management, market, legal, orientation, etc. for this business, for this small business. We offer tickets around $10,000 up to $40,000. And is this one important uh, action to recovery the, the economic impact from pandemic uh, in this small business in Brazil. Uh, the next, please. And another example that it's possible to, to make a different way to, to support um, uh, social and environmental initiatives it's uh, this this business, a small business called uh, Café Apuí. Né? Uh, it's other concrete example uh, in south of the Amazon states in Brazil, né? uh, a region that we know we know here uh, as the arc of deforestation. And in this place, Vale Fund is supporting the production of coffee that values the standing forest too. In this project, uh, get involved about uh, 50 producers who use an uh, agroforest system and in this way uh, we can generate income and preserve the forest in the same time. Yeah? If through this impact business we are reforcing areas, uh, generating income for traditional communities, adopting organic certification and rescuing sustainable family agriculture in this region. Yeah? And through sustainable production, uh, uh, that producers reached a 300% increase in their annual income. And they have also achieved more than 6% increase of in coffee productivity. And, and, and last but not least, uh, the next, please. Another example that uh, value activities in, in voluntary investments. Uh, it's the project Masks Plus Income project. Né? Uh, I would like to present it, uh, after this a short video about the masks, about this project. Uh, and this project was created in the context of the COVID pandemic too, to aim to generate income for women, women in vulnerable situation. Né? It's a good example né, for us of collective action uh, by private sector. It's supported by Vale through Vale Foundation, but with another other partners companies, including uh, two Canadian companies, uh, which on precious metal, that is the main investor uh, in the initiative, and BRKM, uh, uh, that is here, né? 
in this panel, which is, uh, well, thanks for, for the partnerships and through the production of these masks, uh, these women are able to generate income and still distribute these masks in their own communities, strengthening healthcare too. Well, uh, I think the, the best way to show you about this project is show the video. And, and uh, just a legal comment for the next phase, we are counting with the committed support uh, by Rafael Lapierre-Rossi, Vice Consul of Canada in Brazil, responsible for education initiatives and creative industries. Because our idea uh, with ASTA, that is a Brazilian NGO né, that makes support uh, to entrepreneurships is create a platform, a marketplace, a marketplace platform to connect uh, the artisans with the small producers with the local market né, in, in your territories. Well, it's just a legal that uh, values uh, initiatives. And now uh, I am to show the video about this, this, this last project. And thank you so much for the invite. O vírus deixou sem trabalho milhares de mulheres chefes de família, costureiras e artesãs que perderam sua única fonte de renda. Por outro lado, as máscaras passaram a ser item obrigatório para todos, se quisermos contribuir para o fim da pandemia no Brasil. Da união inovadora de empresas com a Rede Asta, surgiu um Máscara Mais Renda. Milhares de artesãs e costureiras de todas as regiões do Brasil estão produzindo máscaras de tecido em suas casas ou em seus ateliês. As máscaras são doadas para organizações indicadas pelas próprias artesãs nas cidades onde vivem, chegando até a quem mais precisa. A iniciativa contribui para a cultura da prevenção e apoia milhares de famílias chefiadas por mulheres. Para mim, no começo foi meio difícil, eu fiquei desempregada, passei bastante tempo em casa, tem o projeto da máscara e melhorou bastante minha vida. Agora eu fazendo por trás de cada máscara tem uma história. E juntos poderemos ter cada vez mais destas histórias para contar. Okay, so thank you very much, Marcia, for all this information. Uh, we're supposed to have um, time for questions, but uh, I'll be warned that we just have one minute left. So I don't think we will have time for answering any questions. So what we're going to do is to, to leave, ah, okay, we have time for one question. They're still telling me, okay. So I have a question for Carlos Almiro, uh, a very quick one. Uh, given the scenario that uh, you just uh, pictured, my friend, how, uh, how do you think that, it, that innovation can contribute can, to the ESG agenda and for the sanitation infrastructure in Brazil? Do you think there is a role to play over there? Yes, thank you, Ricardo. I think uh, we have a, a big positive connection between sanitation and ESG agenda, as I said previously. Uh, because uh, in Brazil, we need real solutions for real problems, real sanitation problems. So for example, uh, we need to universalize the service in Brazil, but we need to improve recycling initiatives with the SLUD because dispose the sludge in landfill, it's not an option. The second point that we need to universalize the service in Brazil, 
but at the same time, we need to reduce carbon emissions. So we need, we strongly need to implement solutions that help us to universalize the service and at the same time offer efficiency in terms of ESG. Thank you, Ricardo. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll try to push another question, but just be warned that we have run out of time. So what we're going to do is to leave all the panelists' contacts uh, in the chat. And if you have any, any specific questions, you get uh, their email addresses over there. So by saying that, I'd like to thank you everybody for the opportunity. Hope you enjoyed the panel. And uh, well, thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye, thanks. Muito obrigada. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye, thank you. Obrigado. Take care. Ciao. Obrigado. Merci. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Obrigada.